What's up, everyone? We're back for another week of Locked On Bucks. A couple of days off. The Australian Wi-Fi not doing me any favors here, but we've got a couple of games to recap, injury reports to get into, perhaps some names that we want to see out on the court coming back here in the next couple of days and more Jordan War talk. The Bucks are pumping him up, and I'm curious why they're pumping him up. I find it very, very interesting. So we're going to get into all that and more on today's show. So let's get started. You are Locked On Bucks, your daily Milwaukee Bucks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Bucks. I'm your host, Kane Pittman. You can hear and see me on this show daily, Monday to Friday, and also find my words over at NBA.com and ESPN. And joining me as he does basically every single Sunday night as we're recording this uh, US time from the Bucks Radio Network is Justin Garcia. And before I bring in Justin, we always thank you guys for making Locked On Bucks the first listen of every single day you can get it for free wherever you get your podcast perhaps now you're watching on youtube as we continue to figure out what it is we are actually doing on youtube and how uh, to do this youtube show but we're working through it we're getting there and thanks for all the support there well over a, a 1000 subscribers now justin what what an introduction yeah. to youtube it's been we're we're very appreciative we're very thankful lots of people jumping in the youtube comments uh either it's uh things you agree with, things you don't agree with. I don't really care. Let us know every uh, whatever you think uh, from the show. Uh, I have got my mic back. Look at this. Incredible. My mic is back. I, I moved house. I didn't have the cord. So thank you for putting up with some dodgy audio the last week. Hopefully it's a little bit better now. But uh, Justin, one of the other issues I had is no Wi-Fi the other day, which meant that I didn't actually watch the game versus the Miami Heat. Well, I did watch it live. I am a, a, pretty psychotic, so I actually went back and watched this game after the fact, which people will just say, why would you possibly put yourself through this? The Heat absolutely blew the doors off the Bucks. This is one of those games where I, I don't think you take too much away from it, whether you're the Heat or the Bucks for that matter. Uh, so was it um, like it, it can't be as bad as I heard people say, let me check this out and go back and watch it. And then two minutes in, you're like, nope, it was. It was everything that I heard it it was. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I saw the post-game um, Zoom call and I, I saw Bud talking about this being a, I, I, not a wake-up call. He didn't say wake-up call, but a good opportunity for some of these young guys mm -hmm. to say, okay, this is what the NBA is about when you talk about Mamu Kalashvili and Justin Robinson. I mean, you've got your two two-way players on the floor playing real rotation minutes in the first quarter against this Miami team that was clearly motivated. So, look, they had so many bodies out that the result like didn't really matter. But I was just curious to see uh, how bad it looked at times. And honestly, we see so many strange results early in the NBA season and – you only have to look at Miami the next night or a couple of nights later, they lost to Indiana who hadn't won a game. And we're seeing so many funny results around the league. I really think that you need to give it at least a month to settle into this. But the reality is if the Bucks play too many games where there's no Brook Lopez, no Drew Holiday, no Dante DiVincenzo, and you can keep going down the list, Bobby Portis, Shemi Ojale, they're not going to win too many games against contending teams at home. Clearly Miami were a little bit motivated. They were super impressive. I'm not, I'm not taking away from them, but I just think from the Bucks' point of view, it was one of those nights that even before the game tipped, you thought, eh, this, this could probably be pretty ugly. Yeah, I mean, you still had Giannis and Chris, so that's where the surprise is that the result was 42 points because that's obviously the most lopsided defeat they've had under Bud, and I think it, it had been like six years since they had a loss like that. So uh, that's what really struck you the most was, okay, I understand you were pretty shorthanded, but you still had Giannis and Chris on the floor, so that part was surprising. Um, we've talked about it on the show too. I'm just not really sure what to expect this season, not just from the Bucks, but from most teams, and especially teams like the Bucks, the Nets, and teams in the Western Conference that went deep in the playoffs. And, you know, you look around now, the, the Nets lost today again. So uh, part of me still wonders, to your point of you give it a month, it, it might be even longer that teams are using this as kind of a long runway to take your time and ease people back in, that it's two straight short off seasons that you had. It might be two months before you really have a good sense of who teams are. 
So I think that the struggles that the Bucks had in that Miami game, certainly some of them transferred over to the San Antonio game uh, that we, as we were recording, we watched yesterday. They beat the Spurs 121 uh, to 111 in a game that wasn't always easy for them. And particularly defensively, uh, there were some struggles there as well. But look, I, I've always said this. I know Giannis was there. I know Chris was there. I know Drew Holiday wasn't. Brooke Lopez wasn't. But I think anytime you look at this Bucks team, and I've always said this, we we think that they're going to be contenders this year. We think that they're right in with a shot to go back to back. Absolutely, we think that. But so much of it is surrounded by health. And this goes for every one of these contending teams. And I think the biggest thing that you notice offensively against a really talented Miami team defensively, I mean, they're versatile. They've got a number of bodies. When they're locked in like that, which isn't yeah. always going to be the case during the regular season, they're not going to be able to play that way. But on this night, they clearly were first time playing against each other. You just really see the impact when you take a third or a fourth option away because the defense doesn't really have to worry about these other guys. They were sending bodies so aggressively and quickly to Giannis and that's where it becomes a bit of a challenge. So I did see some, you know, talk on social media where people are saying, uh, you know, this is why, you know, if it was just Giannis and Chris, they wouldn't be a good team. But if you add in Drew Holiday, they would. I'm like, eh, take Chris out, put Drew in. I still think you're going to have the same the same problem because honestly, what I was thinking about was the Bucks in the playoffs in recent years where the third guy was Eric Bledsoe. But the opposition didn't really care about Eric Bledsoe. And that's when it became really, really hard. So I, I think we saw bits of that. And you'll see that through the year. If one of those guys are missing and you're playing a really good team, the Bucks' offense might struggle. And then clearly, defensively, I think in this San Antonio game was where we really saw the struggle. And to me, I, I again, I had a few people reach out on Twitter and say, geez, the defense looks scratchy. Well, it's going to look pretty scratchy. First of all, when you don't have a real center, and the lineup. And I, I think the last couple of games has been a little bit of a blow for those that say, just play Giannis at center. Because you do realize that when you don't have Brook Lopez out there that's been so central to the Bucks' success defensively the last few years, everyone shifts up. And there's just a lack of respect or a lack of intimidation from opposition teams when they're trying to get in and trying to score at the rim. And I think the other part of it is some of these lineups we're seeing, I'm almost certain that some of these groups have never played together, even in practice, because why would you? So uh, to to expect them to come out and have it all figured out defensively, is it's not very realistic. Yeah, and Bud uh, talked about that. Giannis talked about it too before, uh, I believe before and after the Spurs game of just, you know, that Miami game, especially part of the difficulty was, okay, now you're playing extended minutes with groups that you've never played with before yeah. when you have Mamu playing 27 minutes and Justin Robinson, I think, played around the same. So there was a challenge there. Um, but as everybody pointed out, and I do think it, it'll be helpful for this team months from now, uh, Bud said himself, you know, last year we had this happen as well. The 10 games that Drew Holiday was in health and safety protocols. Yeah, Bobby Port is missing some time and just other stretches where guys were down that you had to play with these unconventional lineups and play with groupings that you weren't used to. And it, it forced the team to play different. And the whole positionless basketball thing, it just gave them more comfort playing with different sets of personnel than, you know, here's our starting five and here's the six man. And that's what we did a lot of previously in the playoffs then having those changes made you better and, and helped you play different ways. So I think that's going to be something that's helpful down the road. Um, you know, I saw most of the same stuff that you did as well. And one of the things we talked about on the network post game show and on our local post game show after the Spurs game was, um, you know, I'm with you that you, I think last night or the game against the Spurs really shines a light on the value of Brook Lopez. And you and I talked about this last year when, there was that two to three week stretch that everybody wanted Mamadi Diakite to be playing extensive minutes. But games like this and last year, you just see the value of Brooke Lopez and everything that he brings. But when you watch that game, you can't help but wonder, okay, next year or two years from now when Brooke Lopez's contract is up, whenever it is, he's no longer here. If Giannis is the five, yeah, there's still some things you have to figure out. And I don't think you're still to the point where you want to do that primarily, but that offense can really hum that you've, you've really surrounded him with more shooters. Now we've said this for the last three years of the upgrade of their shooting and year after year. And, and now it's better. And I think this is the best group of shooters they put around him. I know we said that last year too, but watching that game and seeing Giannis at the five for basically duration of the game and four shooters around him, 
you couldn't help but think if this is what the offense looks like, I mean, this is Giannis unlocking even more. Yeah, no question. I mean, and and I to to your original point there, I think that going through some of this early in the season is great. It's great, obviously, for the development of some of those guys that under normal circumstances maybe don't get to play as much. But it's great for the coaches as well to try different things. Okay, this didn't really work in this game against San Antonio. Who cares? And, and this has been my big point the the whole way along that a lot of the times the Bucs are going to beat these teams anyway. Sometimes you'll run into a Miami. You might play the Brooklyn Nets or the Lakers or whoever it may be, and you would want to be at full strength because if not, it does make it a little difficult. But I didn't think the Bucs were at their best in that game against San Antonio, and they still won by double digits. And they, and, and even within the game, that they still had some further adversity that they had to work around. Drew Holiday was on a minutes limit. I thought he looked really good, but he was only, he only played 25 minutes. Giannis had foul trouble and he was off the court. So you were playing extended minutes with Thanasis playing the five. And Bud was very uh, complimentary of, of Thanasis after the game as well. And I, I don't blame him for that because, listen, Thanasis, that's not his position either. I mean, he's been put in a position yeah. that's, that's completely unnatural for him. And, and the Spurs were taking advantage of that. They were They were really attacking the rim. And you can see, again, we spent so much time talking about drop coverage on this show. And, and this is why I've always said that sometimes it's difficult to just lump everything in and say, well, it's drop coverage. This is causing the problems. This is why they're shooting the threes. Because it is very difficult to play drop coverage with the consistency that the Bucks have over the years. And a big part of that is because Brook Lopez positioning is always so spot on. And we've seen it through last year and we've seen it when they attempted to do it with a bit of Thanasis last night and Giannis, that sometimes that positioning is, is just more difficult uh, to have down pat uh, when you aren't used to doing that. So some challenges for the Bucs. They still came out on one. They're two and one. Uh, it's, it's a pretty good spot to be in as this road trip continues. I want to talk about one big positive from this game, which I think George Hill, I, I thought that he looked really good over these last couple of games. And, and then the Bucs are really invested in Jordan War. I want to explore that a little bit as well after I talk about Prize Picks. Prize Picks has the best NBA DFS prop game on the market. Prize Picks offers more NBA props than any other DFS prop operator and offers all the superstar players as well as bench players, only recording a handful of minutes each game. All of all of your users that deposit and use the, your promo use the promo code NBA, I should say, will receive 100% instant deposit match up to $100. So you pick two two to five players and over and under on their projections, and you can win up to ten uh, times any entry. And it's just you versus the uh, projected numbers. So don't hesitate. Check out PricePicks.com and use the promo code NBA, or go to your app store and download the app today. Price Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Now, Frank the other day was. Uh, very complimentary about direct TV stream. And as well, you should be, because we all know that this is a very, very familiar situation. You've got a device that lets you catch the game live, another that lets you stream your favorite shows. You're watching sports highlights on your phone, and you've got your neighbor's best friends log in for the good stuff. There's no way that I could stream all this stuff over here in Australia, by the way. My internet would absolutely collapse. But I want to tell you about a simple way to get all that entertainment you love without the hassle and a great way to finally get your TV together. It's called Direct TV Stream. And it brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before so you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in the one place. That means no more juggling remotes and no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part, there's no annual contract. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with Direct TV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. So one big positive... George Hill. Now, in this second game against the San Antonio Spurs here, as I uh, pull up my box score, look, he obviously shot the ball well. He played 25 minutes, 15 points, uh, five or six from the field, three for three from three. So first of all, that's a nice relief to see him knock down some threes. It's a little bit of a slow start for him, even though it had only been a couple of games and limited minutes. But the thing that I love is we saw a couple of really good defensive possessions from him, the one that stands out uh, towards at the end of the quarter on... Uh, was it Lonnie Walker, I believe it was, that, that received yeah. the inbound pass. He tried to shoot at the corner three from the right side. George Hill was right in his face, blocked the shot. That's the type of possessions that we used to seeing from George Hill. But I think the other thing was just the aggression on, on the glass. And that Miami game that I put myself through going back and watching the replay, the Bucs are losing this game by 30 points, more than 30 points. And George Hill is still flying around there trying to get rebounds, and, you know, just showing that he's still competing. He's still got the competitive edge on a night where – quite frankly, no one else really did. And it actually stood out with George Hill. And I think that there's been a question mark. I mean, 
I don't know how many of our listeners or viewers watched Oklahoma City last year when George Hill was there, but I certainly did not. So I don't know what he looked like, but motivation is such a big thing uh, for these, these veteran players. And he just looks like a guy that's happy. He looks like a guy that's happy to be back, to compete, to play that role that we got used to. And this is big. This is genuinely big for the Bucs because uh, last year the backup point guard spot was a question mark. Yeah, I uh, I hope our listeners didn't see a whole lot of George Hill uh, last well, year. And I, I know I didn't. And even uh, when he when he played uh, the Bucs with Oklahoma City, he was unavailable. So we didn't get a chance to see him in that game, I remember, early in the season. But statistically, he played great in Oklahoma City. And you just look at how he was used in Philadelphia. And I, we talked about this before, too. But what he was asked to do and what Philadelphia needed from him, it's not going to be what the Bucs need, where he needed to be a shot creator and scorer with the Sixers. And here it's just hey, we, we need you to run the second unit, and occasionally we're going to be playing you with Drew Holiday or Dante at the same time when he's healthy. So I think that's going to be a boost for him. Uh, you can't help but point to the shooting percentages that he had his final year in Milwaukee, and he always just seems to play better under Bud. So, um, you know, I saw some people already maybe raising an eyebrow and getting a little uncertain over the preseason. And so to see him early in the season get one of these games where it's like, nope, he's he's still that guy. I think that definitely alleviates some of those concerns that you have. But, you know, I, I saw and I don't remember who it was. I wish I could give him the credit, but somebody else pointed out uh, last night. There's just something about George Hill that, you know, we've you look at Pat Connaughton and he has certainly had it and figured out that chemistry and how to play with Giannis. And I don't think there's any denying George Hill is in the same boat that he's just had this knack for where he needs to be and what he needs to do alongside Giannis. So I think that's another thing that you get in the mix where last year that couldn't have been easy on DJ Augustine uh, or anybody, Jeff Teague, whoever it was that the Bucks were kind of cycling through there. It's okay. We have high aspirations. We're a title contender. We need you to learn all this and build some chemistry like today. George Hill has that. So I think that's going to help too, where, you went through the wholesale changes last year. You just did some tinkering this year. But one of the tinkers is bringing in a guy that already has that familiarity and chemistry with Giannis and Chris and and most of the, the guys he's going to be playing with on the second unit. I think as a ball handler, there is an art to playing with Giannis. I mean, we all sit there and say, okay, well, you're playing with arguably the best player in the world. Just get him the ball. And and Dante yeah. DiVincenzo is the guy that I'll always point to that very early in his rookie season, he figured out any transition possession, just give Giannis the ball. And this was something that used to frustrate Bucks Twitter and social media and fans with Malcolm Brogdon that he never seemed to give the ball up to Giannis. Dante always did it. And to be honest, that's smart if you're a young player. Feed the superstar. He's going to love you. You're going to form that relationship. But for George Hill, it, it's it's in a, a variety of different ways because he has been a ball handler throughout his career. But in Milwaukee, he is asked to to do, I would say, even when he's in the lineup, he's not often the, the primary ball handler. He's sometimes that secondary guy that can run off secondary actions. And if things break down a little bit, he can still set a pick and roll. He can facilitate. But he's also become a really good spot-up shooter. So, look. I think it's it's a clearly a fit that we're very comfortable with, that we've seen the relationship is there. And I would agree. Uh, I think probably the last two games in particular, when the Bucks haven't looked that great, the fact that you can still look at George Hill and say, okay, well, look, this is a long season. He is an older player. There's probably going to be ups and downs. I don't expect him to shoot 45%, 46% from three. But if he, if he is a guy that by the time we get to the postseason, we're like, all right, we don't need to worry about the backup point guard. Uh, then that's all you can really ask for. But you mentioned Giannis. I think. Uh, I think. It, <laughs> look, I'm basically at this point doing free uh, promo for this Twitter account, and I don't really know why. Maybe it's because in my head I think it's Frank. But the Giannis free throw tracker update. We'll probably do this once a week. Six for eight against San Antonio. Uh, so he is up at seventy point four percent from the free throw line on the season. So uh, shout out. To Giannis there. Look, I think the over and under we had, like, can he get to 72%, which he's been around that mark in previous seasons, over it in previous seasons. Uh, but, yeah, look, let's keep it over 70. Let's keep it over 70, Giannis. Push up a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, for Giannis again, knocked down a few jump shots against San Antonio. Nothing that, that really stood out, obviously, in foul trouble uh, in this game uh, against the Spurs. And that's probably one of the bigger points when it comes to him playing consistently at the five. You do open yourself up to... Uh, more 
rim protection that you need to create or more shots that you need to try and stop at the rim, which can put you in trouble yeah. uh, with foul trouble as well. And we saw that in that game against San Antonio. Yeah, it's um, it's just different because, you know, uh, he's a good rim protector, but it's not like Brook where there's this big stationary object there that you're just deterred from driving that a lot of times Giannis will try to bait people into attacking the rim and he comes to clean it up. So I think that's the biggest difference. Um, that's a clever Twitter handle too, by the way, to, to include the cue for tracker, but, uh, what he was six of eight against the Spurs, I think. So yeah, something like that. Um, I mean, overall he's been good early in the season, but I, you know, we can point to, mid-range shots and everything else. And I think it's funny that we've all kind of gotten over the three-point shot that it's no longer roll your eyes when he takes it, but nobody's keeping an eye on, hey, he was two of three on threes or he's hit five of his last seven that it's just kind of, you know, whatever he does, fine, good or bad. To me, the two things that I am paying most attention to with him this year, I mean, sure, what he does in that short mid-range and how he scores around the basket when it's not just dunks, but... The free throws is one, but also uh, in that game against the Spurs, he assisted on 22 points. So he had eight assists, six were on threes, and I think uh, four of the six were to George Hill and Pat Connaughton. So again, if when they play those lineups, and he did this very well last year that for most of the season, he was in the upper 10, I believe, in, in points assisted. Um, but when they play those lineups and he's surrounded by shooters, the points that he's going to be able to create because he has shooters around him. We pointed to uh, opening night. I think we talked about it too. He should have had a triple double that night with the shots that he was creating for his teammates. And I think against San Antonio, you saw a lot of those shots start to fall. So that to me is the other thing to keep an eye on throughout the season is he's going to set guys up with open looks. And it feels like this year more than ever before, those are going to be three pointers that are falling. Not a good start for those that took the over on the 29.9 points per game. So I'm talking about me. Uh, we, can't, we can't be having these 20-point games, you know, so we're going to get that point scoring up. I reckon a good way that he could do that, uh, find that, find that extra, I don't know, find that extra power to be able to score, to be able to get over 30 would be eat, to eat more built Bars. Uh, of course, we know. Uh, that that would uh, absolutely help in the best tasting protein bar that's ever been made. I wonder what favorite flavor Giannis would have. Would he be a, a milk, mint brownie guy or a double chocolate salted caramel? I'm not 100% sure. We've seen him eating snacks in the press conferences before. I haven't seen him have a Built Bar yet, and I wonder if he's aware of Built Bar. We've got to find out a way uh, to get Giannis a Built Bar and he can uh, have one in the press conference. I'm sure that he would play uh, a great game if he if this was his pregame snack. Not only are Built Bar flavors the best tasting, but they're also healthy too. And Built Bar is the official protein bar of the U.S. track and field team. So just go to Built.com, use the promo code LOCKED, and you'll get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCKED for 15% off at Built.com. Uh, this episode is also brought to you by rockauto.com, our longtime friends. And with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. So uh, skip having all those conversations, trying to figure it out what it is you need, and then they don't have the brand anyway, and it costs too much. You can choose, uh, why would you choose to spend 30%, 50%, even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or car dealership, Rock Auto. Uh, the prices are reliably low for every single customer. They have everything that you could need from brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, and even new carpet. You can explore their easy-to-use website today. Just go to rockauto.com to see all the parts available for your car or truck right locked on in there. How did you hear about us? Box today, know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. Some pretty good news on the injury on the injury front, and this graphic that I've just put up on the screen just says it all. The game is in Indiana today, so I, I don't know. Typically, I've I've covered the Bucks multiple times in Indiana, and pretty good Bucks contingent of fans gets out there, particularly the last couple of years when they've really been winning. So maybe we will hear a Bobby chant in the uh, in the field house in Indiana. I'm not 100 percent sure, but Brook Lopez is still out. Uh, this back soreness, this back issue is is lingering a little bit here. It's fine. Whatever. Do whatever you need to do to get him healthy. As as long as it's not a concern long term, I'm not going to spend any time worrying about it. Give him all the rest he needs. But Bobby Portis may come straight into the starting lineup. If he's healthy, 
Uh, there's, there was no media today. The Bucks were instead spending time on George Hill's ranch, so they didn't have time to do any media or practice or anything like that. But Bobby Portis back, that would be a lot of fun. Unfortunately, Drew Holiday again is on the injury report. We'll see whether he plays this time. It's an ankle, not the heel. We saw that in the San Antonio game. He pulled up a little bit sore, was hobbling around a little bit, stayed out on the floor, looked fine, maybe a, a bit sore after the game. Again, they're not going to take any precautions. But if there's one thing that we've taken away from the last two games, the Bucks could use a big fella in the lineup. Bobby Portis, this would be good. We haven't seen him at all apart from a really small stint in the scrimmage going back about a month ago. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, uh, just the scrimmage and then with the Shemi Ojale, who's another one that we don't know what to expect because we haven't seen him in anything so yeah. far, but, but, you know, um, we've, everyone is, has pointed to and talked about, this is probably the best and deepest team with just the talent that they have, um, that they've, that they've assembled under bud. But the one thing you would point to is, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a deep team, but, uh, it's pretty thin in the front court. And, and I mean, we talked about it on several shows too of, yeah, the only thing that would make you a little nervous is if an injury pops up to Bobby Portis or Brooke Lopez, then you don't really have a lot of places to turn. And they start the season with injuries popping up to all of those guys. <laughs> so, you know, kind of like w- what we talked about a couple of minutes ago, I'm, I'm sure there is some benefit to have to figure things out and play with a different groupings and utilize guys and, and give guys like Sandro Mamu Kelashvili minutes early on, though we did see against San Antonio, it was kind of, all right, we don't want to overexpose you too quickly because he only played a handful of minutes in that game, but it's going to be good to have Bobby back just to, if, if for no other reason to alleviate some of that off of Giannis too, where you don't have to play those minutes early where Giannis is the five and you're playing small. So you can play him with Bobby and you can give him more rest and, you know, just see, how Bobby Portis fits in with some new teammates, especially on the second unit. We talked about the chemistry that uh, George Hill has with certainly Pat Connaughton and Giannis and Chris, but you figure those two guys are going to be sharing the floor a decent amount of time this year. So for Bobby Portis to get back in the mix with this team and uh, see what he's added to his game and see how he plays with those new guys. So it's going to be good to see him back and to take some of that burden off of Giannis, especially. So the other player that wasn't listed on the injury report, we'll see whether he plays Rodney Hood. We only saw him very briefly uh, in a preseason game and it wasn't great, but you know, whatever. It was his first little stint here. So we'll see whether he comes into the rotation and plays any minutes at all in this game at Indiana. That tip-off is 6 p.m. Central time. As I said, the pace has come off. They've actually had a couple of overtime games already. They've lost both of those, but Sabonis has been in incredible form. So again, you know, maybe maybe you do want a, a bigger guy in there that can try and defend Sabonis. He's obviously a unique uh, big man there, but we'll see what happens. Before we wrap it up, I wanted to talk about Jordan War, and I've been fascinated. I'm going to pull up a tweet here that the Bucks put out, and it is a quote from Drew Holiday. And Drew Holiday says, Jordan is my favorite player. Now, I mean, that's that's... Favorite player. It's pretty high praise there from Drew Holiday. He said he's going to be really good in this league. He's like a younger Chris. And then Jordan Wara had a quote himself. This is from Jim Ozarski over at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. He's got a story there that you can check out uh, at the Journal Sentinel. So he's, this is Jordan Wara. He says, it comes down to me and how hard I want to work. Nobody's forcing me to do this. So I think it's more of an innate thing where I just know what I have to do and I want to make everybody happy and proud. Now I'm not I'm not saying this is a as a negative thing for Jordan Wara because we spoke uh, we've spoke already about the type of minutes that he got last season and the situations that he was asked to play lots of garbage time lots of really strange lineups so we just haven't seen him have the opportunity to play with starters and have a big chase down block like he could did against San Antonio or make a defensive play like he did against Kevin Durant on opening night but we're starting to see one or two things every single night where you're like okay. That's what you need to do if you're a complimentary player playing alongside these starters. The message seems to have gotten through to him. And clearly by the way these guys are responding to him, not only the players, but even Bud, they seem like this, this, it sticks out to me that they are all so publicly vocal in their support of Jordan Warrior. They seem to really believe in him, which does tell you something because we don't see everything. We don't see what he's like in practice. We don't see what he's like away from the court, but that seems really positive. 
Yeah, there's a there's a couple of things, and not to relitigate the whole um, all the other young guys that have passed through here, but um, you mentioned it, it. These things seem to have stuck with Jordan Wara and blocking Kevin Durant and starting a fast break and doing the same thing in the chase down block against the Spurs. That he's he's piecing together these plays that aren't Jordan Wara hitting a step back three. It's mm-hmm. him rebounding or passing the ball and playing defense. And that's what we we've heard Bud say for three plus years now that those are the winning plays you have to make if you're going to get in the rotation and stay in the rotation. And, um, you know, other young guys that have passed through, we've seen some of them put up big numbers in the G league and in the other reps that they were given, albeit brief with the NBA club. But the point was always, okay, that's not what you're going to be asked to do here at this level, at least not yet. And with Jordan Wara, that seems to have registered of, okay, I'm going to get shots, but I can't be out here hunting shots. I have to facilitate and I have to play defense, especially in rebound. And we've seen that from him. And, you know, seeing him play with the starters too, I think all of us were kind of wondering what's this going to look like because of those groupings you mentioned last year. And to see it early in the preseason and he looked very comfortable and looked like he belonged. I mean, we remember the, the summer league performance that he had, where I think a lot of us had very high expectations. And then you saw summer league and you thought, huh, I, I wonder if maybe we're over inflating him, but he's doing all the little things where it's, it's not the guy we saw in summer league, which again, I can't, you don't really hold against him because it's, it's glorified G league where somebody needs to score. And that was Jordan Wara, but he's doing those little things and the praise that that you mentioned with, with Drew Holiday talking about him and Jordan Wara talking about the things he knows he needs to do. We were talking about this before we started recording. It, it, it reminds me in many ways of Dante DiVincenzo's first two years in the league, where especially that rookie year, everybody remembers he was the first guy off the bench for the team. But we heard repeatedly about Dante DiVincenzo that, yeah, I mean, he he's, he's a big part of the team and we're going to need him. And He's going to be good. We heard that over and over from Giannis and and everybody else that, yeah, Dante is a big part of this team. And it's starting to feel a lot like what we're hearing with Jordan Wara, that they realize this guy can fill some holes that we have with his shot profile and what he can do offensively. But what's most impressive is where he's progressing and coming along in those other areas. And it's kind of like behind the scenes, Everybody else with the team that's in practice and practices with him sees those things happen. We're not seeing it yet because of his playing time in games, but we've seen this with a couple of young players before where they're telling you, no, trust me, he's good, and you're going to see it eventually, and we're already starting to hear that with Jordan Wara. Yeah, he's almost the the reverse of Dante when, when you bring that up. because yeah. Those those players that the Bucks want to see more of from Jordan Wara are so natural for Dante he did that from his first yeah. minutes in the NBA which is why he was able to stick in the rotation which is why Jordan Moore this is why I've been saying it I love the fact that they're coaching him up because we know he can score but the Bucks don't necessarily need a lot of scoring if they're at full health because they've got so many different guys that can score but he is one of the rare guys on the roster that has genuine upside so that's why there's so much excitement and I think it's cool to see that the Bucks seem to have so much confidence in him so as we wrap it up uh, remind you guys about the fantasy, the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast with my guy, uh, Josh Lloyd. There is a lot of injuries around the league. There's guys that are springing up that people didn't expect to be putting up big numbers. So if you're playing fantasy, uh, you should be listening to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Of course, after Locked On Bucks, but, you know, still check it out. It's a, it's a great show. Uh, very popular. Some of the numbers that show does is absolutely ridiculous. So Bucks and Paces, 6 p.m., Central time. Like I said, the Pacers have been playing pretty good basketball. Miles Turner had a 40 point game. So again, we talk about that the Bucks struggling. High. Just talk about the Bucks struggling with big men. Uh, they got Miles Turner and uh Demantis Sabonis to deal with tomorrow. And of course, our old friend Malcolm Brogdon will be out there unless he picks up some sort of uh toe injury or finger or back or hip or groin or hamstring or calf or knee or neck or something like that. Then then he won't play. But otherwise he'll be out there. So we look forward to that. Justin, you'll be on the call. We'll be able to hear you if we listen to the Bucks Radio Network. So make sure you do that if you're not in front of your TV. And we'll be back post game. My internet's working. We're back. Everyone's happy for Justin and myself. Uh, We will leave it there and we'll catch you guys tomorrow.